Welcome to the Invested Dads Podcast, simplifying financial topics so that you can take action and make your financial situation better, helping you to understand the current world of financial planning and investments. Here are your hosts, Josh Robb and Austin Wilson. I'm not a pro. I'm a horrible speller. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to the Invested Dads Podcast, where we are bringing you an important update surrounding the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. And Josh, we have a special guest with us. So who do we have? That's right. Today we have Adam Zerker with us. He is uh, one of the founders of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management and also one of our bosses. Um, We have two bosses. I can't tell you which one's my favorite because I'm not sure who writes my checks. (laughs) But Adam is here today and he is the chief investment officer and would love to come and talk a little bit about the coronavirus and how that's been impacting the markets. So Adam, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Austin, for having me on your podcast today. Very excited to share the thinking out of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. We've been meeting, it seems like around the clock, whether yeah. it's in the office or virtually um, from our homes using uh, all the current technology to keep uh, in touch with each other throughout these crazy markets. But so my story is um, back in 2002, I left a CPA firm after working there for three years um, to start this wealth management firm. And as we'll talk about later, we were actually in a bear market at the time and Seems not, <laughs> not much different than the circumstances we're in today. So, um, I have some experience with this and I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing some things I've learned over the years. So my experience goes back to 1999. So I'm, I'm in my 21st year and been working with clients all those years. And so, my business partner, Tony Hickson, and I, we founded the firm in order to help people um, create wealth, protect wealth, achieve their financial goals. And we just saw a huge need for uh, guidance from a fiduciary fee-only financial advisor. And so the two of us started with zero clients, zero assets under management. And over, well, we started in 2002. So this coming year will be our 18 year anniversary. And over the past 18 years, we've been able to build a team that I'm very proud of. And, uh, as we talked about last night, um, it's amazing just the level of care that our team has for our clients. And so I can't wait to share the thoughts that are coming out of our office and the way we're helping clients and that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, so today we manage, well, depending on the day, somewhere between, let's just say 160 and 180 of assets under management, 160 to 180 million serve over 200 households, mostly individuals and families, some institutions. And, um, we're just here to help people. We want to guide them through these crazy markets. All right. And you are an invested dad as well, uh, like Austin and I. So tell us a little bit about your family. Yeah. Well, I have three awesome kids. Um, my oldest just turned 16. And I will remember her birthday, her 16th birthday forever, because the S&P 500, um, the last all-time high was February 19th. Her birthday was the 20th. There you go. So I don't know if she's the one that triggered this bear market, (laughs) but... Um, the the driver's pan- license. The, the yeah. panic selling is the new driver on the roads. <laughs> Lots of new things happen in my, in my life. So I have my 16-year-old daughter. I have an 8-year-old daughter, and I have a 7-year-old son. So, um, yeah, it's awesome being an invested dad. And, uh, you know, my family is one of the greatest joys of my life and love spending time with them when I'm not in the office. Yep. What are the one of the things you like to do with them? You know, our favorite thing to do, and we just talked about this last night, is boating. Mm. so we have a wake boat and we're getting into surfing behind the boat and um we you know wakeboarding surfing the kids love to do anything in the water whether it's swimming going to the beach or just being out on a boat and wouldn't we all like to be out on a boat today that would be great (laughs) there's no virus worries out on a boat i wouldn't think so (laughs) so adam we had an episode a couple weeks ago where we talked about the coronavirus at a pretty high level Things have changed a lot since then, and I thought we'd give you the opportunity to kind of share the latest developments around the virus. Well, yes. It's amazing how fast things can change. Um, Just yesterday, both the S&P 500 and the Dow plunged nearly 10%. Big move. Now, you've seen, you know, the psychology of nines, I, I call it, you know, so when you go to buy something, 
it's on sale for $99 or $999. Yesterday, the Dow dropped 9.99%. Yeah. So that make you they feel didn't good want to or, see the 10. Yeah, yeah. should that it make you feel 10? good or bad? I don't yeah. know. You know, I think it looks better than a 10% than 10. drop. It see, does. The, so, the news was calling it 10, yeah. and I knew it wasn't 10. Yeah. Not quite 10. And look look what the futures are doing this morning. Here we are. It's uh, Friday morning. It's about 8.30 a.m. And the futures are up strong. Um, 6%-ish. Yep. Trading curbs on the futures. So yep. people are, are are anxious to buy. So yeah. that 9.99% discount is a buying opportunity. Exactly. Um, anyhow, yesterday, that was the worst loss for stocks since the crash in October 1987. Daily. Daily. Yeah. Yes. yes. Worst daily drop. Worst point drop for the Dow. Correct. Ever. Um, yesterday's historic decline ended a bull market that lasted nearly 11 years. So as I mentioned before, the S&P 500 hit an all-time high on February 19th. We're now down 27% from an all-time high. And in that big drop from February 19th through yesterday, I believe it's the fastest bear market on record. It seemed pretty quick. It, it felt like it. Yeah, it <laughs> definitely did. I think the speed of the decline has a lot of people really shaken. You know, right. I mean, they wonder, wow. How, how fast can we go? How far can we go and how fast will it happen? Yeah. yeah. And you wonder if some of it has to do with technology, the ease of trading now for the average investor. You know, I could place a trade on my phone instead of picking up the phone, calling somebody, asking them to place a trade. It's a lot easier for me to make that quick decision and not have to talk through with somebody else before that trade happens. So maybe that's part of the issue as well. And the big boys, and, think about it. The big oh, yeah. boys have electronic trading and automatic trading yeah, and buttons. high frequency trading. And they're, all these triggers are automatically triggering trades. So yeah, I think it could probably compound the speed that we've seen. Absolutely. So between computer driven trading and then just the ease of trading, I think, you know, in some cases it might be too easy. Yep. Um, but also very convenient. Technology has made it convenient and it's given us the ability to act quickly when we need to. Yeah. Uh, unless sure. you're on Robin Hood. I think they've been <laughs> yeah, having some yeah. trouble lately. They've had some troubles. There's some lawsuits coming. <laughs> it's amazing there hasn't been more of that, you know, with True. some of the other brokerages. But yeah, you know. well, even some of them have that in their their description or when you sign up you agree right. to, sometimes they will limit trading. Exactly. So, you know, um then we had the Fed getting involved here over oh, yeah. the past week. So Last week, I believe it was uh, a week ago, Tuesday, the Federal Reserve, they had an emergency rate cut of half a percent. Um, it, it, then, then yesterday, they also took very aggressive steps by flooding the market with $1.5 trillion of liquidity and widening their purchases of U.S. government securities. So the Fed has taken some really aggressive steps to help keep markets liquid and, um, you know, yesterday's news, the market popped for a little bit, but not for long. It was right back down. That, yeah. right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that the market isn't quite, you know, too excited about the moves they've made so far. I think they're expecting more. And I think you can expect more from the Fed. Um, yeah. They have a meeting plan for next week. And we, we certainly expect them to lower rates more at that meeting, if not before. Correct. And do you think this is it, obviously the Fed is really looking at the economy? The uh, the market is an is a representation of the economy, but they're looking at like flooding the all that money into what's more liquidity for the banks, making sure that businesses have that cash. Right. And what the stock market does is should be irrelevant to the Fed. They should be looking at what the economy needs and, and adjusting it that way. And exactly. then hopefully then the market will respond to that what the economy is doing. But hopefully the Fed is indifferent to what the market's doing and only doing what's needed for the economy and giving what's best there, not responding to any kind of pressure to help the market recover from its down. Exactly. Yeah. The Fed's job is to worry about the economy, to keep the financial system liquid. And, uh, I think, I think they're doing the right things. Um, but yeah, you're right. They, they shouldn't be, uh, making these moves just for the sake to prop the market back up. Yeah. Right. And I think that, it's good to keep in mind that before any virus uncertainty happened, so think about through January, through the beginning of February, really, at least here in the States, the economy was doing phenomenal. We just got, last Friday, we got jobs report for January, which was f amazing. It was just blow out of the water good. 
50 year low unemployment number. Three and a half percent. Well, so yeah, the Fed chair Powell, he actually said at the end of February that the fundamentals remain strong. Yeah. And so that was his quote at the end of February. So again, you know, before the virus really set in with this panic that we're seeing, right. The economy, the underlying economy was, was doing well. So I'm, yeah, I'm with Adam. I think that next week on the 18th, when they meet or before, we'll probably get another 50 basis point. Yeah. Cut. They just want to make they want to make borrowing easier to for small businesses that might need it, or or for people just to keep push pushing some spending out in the economy when the uncertainty is yeah. going on. And I on. think that small business is the key, is because they're the ones that True. are going to be impacted by a quarantine or any kind of slowdown. If people aren't going out and buying, that's the that's who's getting hurt. Those small businesses. So anything they can do to help them will have a better impact long term on the economy to get it recovered. So what's next? I mean, what's driving all this in the market? What do you see? It looks more to me like panic or pain selling. Like there's kind of this, you know, compounding of, oh, it looks like people are selling. I should sell too. Is that what's going on here? Well, you know, we we first heard about the coronavirus. I don't know. What was it? December, perhaps yeah, um, when we year. heard about it in, in China. And it we saw the growth rates in China in January, late January. And then the market seemed to kind of shrug its shoulders for a while. And then, um, you know, even into, uh, March here, you know, I, I, I was waiting for a bigger reaction from the market, Mm -hmm. but I think what we saw and and also a bigger reaction from our leaders, Mm -hmm. you know, what are we going to do to keep it from spreading here in the U S and to me, Wednesday night kind of seemed like the turning point for our country, right? That was the evening that Trump went on TV to address the nation from the Oval Office, which I think is only the second time he's done an address from the Oval Office in his term. But, um, you know, he gave his his speech. And I think a lot of Americans believe that this was the first time that Trump took the threat of the coronavirus seriously. And in that speech, he he announced new travel restrictions. He announced and, and when he announced it, though, he, he made a little goof. He said, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days, which wasn't quite accurate. When the details were released later that evening, the rules actually barred foreigners who had been in Europe in the previous 14 days from entering the U.S. Gotcha. So there was a little bit of a, you know, I've been following all of this on Twitter, which, by the way, I think Twitter is an amazing source of information, but it can also be a big source of misinformation. So, Correct. Yep. Um, but um, there's been a, you know, there, there was some criticism there on how he handled that announcement and it, it kind of seemed like a rush decision. And we heard the next day that he, he really didn't even consult with European leaders, but, um, for the second night in a row, in addition to that, Americans were expecting some sort of an announcement about some economic stimulus, some sort of a, a policy that will help the economy as businesses shut down. Um, very little was announced, you know, there's a few ideas, but it seemed very clear that, that, um, you know, politicians are divided on how they should be handling this. And what complicates it is it's an election year, right? Absolutely. Yep. So we'll, we'll talk about that more in the show later in the show, but within an hour of that speech that evening, we found out that the NBA season would be canceled, yeah. suspended. Yep. Yeah. Now that's a big deal. That's a big deal. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, think of all those players, all that revenue. Oh, yeah. Um, and so the NBA cancels. And then later we find out not much long, a few minutes after that, that Tom Hanks has the coronavirus. I mean, I think that's a bigger deal than the NBA. As Tom Hanks is America's, he's as America's guy. He's as American as apple pie. Yeah, but he got it in Australia. I mean, maybe he was having some shrimp on the Barbie yeah. while he did that. But. <laughs> that might be. <laughs> he was on an island. That's and, but he wasn't alone. That was a problem. If he would have been stranded on an island, I think he was pretty he, good at that. He would have been all right. Okay, so sidebar Wilson, the volleyball. Yeah, named after you. Named after me. I thought so. Yep. So wow. the NBA. You know what is um, interesting to me is you would wonder if they continued to have the games with no fans, if that would actually be a boost for their online or their TV ads, which then they could ask for more money from the TV ads to offset the cost. So I wonder. You know, between the two, if they ran the analysis and wondered well, which one the, would make LeBron more sense. was very vocal. I know some of the key stars were, were and, not and the fact fans that of it. so the, the the player the first player that now there have been I think two players that have gotten effect that have been infected, but the first player who was really not cool about some yes. of the way he yeah. handled that, but the first player who 
did that. He's they've been playing, so you don't really show signs for a while. Mm-hmm. They've been playing games and games for weeks, right? Yeah, and so, they so for all the players, yeah, all the players that he's had contact with, and all this stuff. That's been yeah. hundreds of players, probably or whatever. I think I heard something like seventeen teams would have had That's been impacted crazy. through yeah. all the. And, well, so, and then yeah. travel. So everywhere they go, hotels, all that. I mean, that just extends that yep, range. So it, it makes sense. It just I always wondered, like, you know, obviously they they pre-sold all those ads. Are they going to refund those? How does you know? There's a lot of costs involved when you do something big like this. Speaking of refunds, there's going to be a lot of upset people about a lot of things. Yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, think yeah. of all the things that have been prepaid. Yeah. We had a yeah. volleyball tournament um, next weekend. Big volleyball tournament in mm-hmm. Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Three day tournament. We had to book our hotel room months in advance. They're going to refund it, of course. But uh, even the volleyball club that we're part of, you know, yeah, um, they've already paid for all these tournaments. And that's just a simple example. But, you know, yeah. think about those that have season tickets yep. to the NBA games, you know. Yep. Um, it's going to be a mess. Yep. But, you know, so, you know, back to your question, Josh, about the selling, you know, what created all this selling yesterday. So we had the NBA, um cancel. And it seemed like that was kind of the domino, the the first domino to drop. Um, because throughout the day, we, uh, yesterday, the following day, we had so many other sports leagues and big venues announcing cancellations and suspensions. So, you know, the list is pretty long, but it includes NCAA March madness. That's big. That's huge. (laughs) Um, imagine the, the lost revenue there. Major league, major league baseball is delayed for at least two weeks. Um, Soccer, Major League yep. Soccer is on hold for 30 days. The NHL suspended their season. The PGA Tour is suspended. I heard that the Boston Marathon uh, is postponed till the fall. And that's crazy. So I have a friend at church that qualified for that, and he's really? planning on going. And so you think you, you train hard for this date, and you have a schedule on how you're preparing up for that. Now they bump it down the road. And so now you got to continue that training, and your body takes a lot of wear and tear for this. I don't know personally because I don't run anywhere near where, where <laughs> yeah, those people say, do. This gives people some time to enjoy but, some Twinkies and bonbons. But do they though? Or do they have to continue this regiment for longer? And what will that do to their bodies? Right. And so, and now you're running in a different season. Right. So, you know, a lot of things change. And for something like that, you may, that may be your one lifetime dream to qualify for this. And now yeah. it may put it in jeopardy on can I actually do right. this the way I was hoping to? We were talking last night at dinner. I think one of the, things that really, I don't know, just kind of saddens me the most is just look at all these high school kids that right now we're, we're heading into the state basketball tournament and I'm a big basketball fan. And, um, you know, um, seeing them, you know, it's every high school basketball player's dream to play for a state championship in front of a packed crowd, you know, and, and win a state title. You know, um, my daughter was on a state championship volleyball team last fall and, I can't imagine if we would have played the whole season and then knowing that we had the potential to win the title and then the whole event gets canceled. No one's there. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's canceled. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's Mm -hmm. a small town down the road from us, Columbus Grove. Their their high school boys basketball team is something like 25 or 26 and 0. We have a client with a son that plays and they've had a great season. You know, I think everybody thinks they have potential to win state or at least get to state, you know. Um, anyhow, I I just feel bad for those kids because who knows if they will ever have a chance to play that game, you know, and even if they do, the schools have now canceled all activities for three weeks, so they can't practice True, and they're just, everybody's going to be a different team. It's just going to be a different environment if it happens at all. And so I I just feel bad for those kids that have worked hard for a goal that, but it's also a life lesson, right? Yep. We can't control these events that happen, yeah. um, but we can certainly control how we respond to them. Um, yeah. So, you know, Broadway shut down. I know. Unbelievable. Yeah. Actually, so my wife was actually, so we've been to some Broadway shows, not on Broadway, but like in Columbus and Toledo and Chicago, wherever we're at, we'll, we'll like to do that. Well, she's like talking about, I think Lion King is coming to Toledo. I'm sure it's all going to be. Yeah, it's been on the TV. Every and time the song starts, my dog, we my youngest star looks we up. We went and saw Lion King in Columbus, I think, five or six years ago, and it was amazing. So she's like, yeah, let's go, let's go. And I don't think we're going now. <laughs> I think that that's going to be shut down. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cultural impacts now that things are shutting down as well. So well, like any expo in the country, pretty much, where there's right. a bunch of people gathering, not happening. Not happening. And one of the big things is the happiest place on earth. 
Yeah. So it's Austin. no longer going to be so happy. You know, we've been, we're, we're all Disney fans. We've been following uh, the stock, the business. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a company that we think is well run. And, and you know, they, they just added Disney Plus, which yeah. is good for this environment. Exactly. But what about their theme parks closing? What's the impact to Disney? I mean, Disney's operating income is over half coming from their theme parks. And right. they've got theme parks all around the globe. So first of all, they have two theme parks in China. Those have been shut down for a while. And now I think they're like limited reopening with people having to limited a number of people with having to wear masks all the time and stuff like that. There's one in Japan that's shut down. Um, I'm sure France has a lot of cases, so I'm sure that one's shut down. And as of yesterday, the at least the one in California, and I'm assuming Orlando will follow suit, are sh- going to be shut down too. So big part of Disney's profits are coming to a halt for a little bit. Okay. So I know your listeners are asking the question, what Uh-oh. if what if I own Disney stock? What does this mean for my stock? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, and we follow Disney pretty closely, I think that people are crazy about Disney. You know, people go there and spend obscene amounts of money, obscene amounts of money and this is probably going to only push back. So it's going to be delayed revenue. This revenue is going to come. This profit is going to come, but it's going to be pushed back six months, a year, whatever that looks like. You're still going to take your trip to Disney. It's just going to be a little bit down the road. They're going to let this kind of uncertainty pass. So we feel like Disney fans are are strong enough of fans and, and care about doing that with their kids that they're going to do it. It's just going to be a little bit. So look past the short term. Exactly. Probably a hit to earnings yes. in the short oh, term. Oh, for sure. For but sure. Long, long term, term, the thesis is maybe, there. Maybe even an opportunity. And but. the other factor, though, too, is ESPN. Yeah. You know, with all these cancellations, the other part of Disney's revenue, revenue is ABC and ESPN. And that's the other piece you know, that's factoring in. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot of short-term issues going on. But in the long run, you know, they're a big media company that has a lot of different sources of revenue. And I think, again, you know, if you're a long-term investor... It's still one to consider. I actually read an article this morning that this could be the opportunity that Apple was waiting for to buy Disney. Wow. Disney stock's down. It's in the 90s. They could buy a lot of companies right now. (laughs) Apple's sitting on more cash than they know what to do with. They've been waiting for a time like this. Exactly. And with Iger not being the CEO, it could open up some discussions, but he's still on the board. So, hey, I'm just saying that's on the table. Yeah, sure. Between Apple and Berkshire you re- and all, you read this- that on Twitter where everything's yeah, true. Right? Everything's true. Yeah, any company that's sitting on crazy amounts of cash, I think of Apple and Berkshire specifically, they can go shopping and get a thirty, forty percent discount or more if you're looking in energy and banks. So. It's going to be fun watching uh, to see what Buffett bought. Exactly. This exactly. So, bottom line here, I think is you know. The impact of all these cancellations and shutdowns is definitely there's going to be lost spending. There's going to be a hit to profits. Um, there is going to be an economic impact. Um, you know, and then furthermore, at the end of yesterday, we found out here in Ohio that our governor has banned most gatherings of a hundred or more. And not only that, but K through 12 schools will be canceled for three weeks beginning Monday. Yeah, that's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I, you, I, you. I think I, those people, so first of all, that has a huge impact to p- people who work, parents who work. Yep. That is going to be a, it's going to be a challenge because that is, you know, that their children are at school a lot. Yep. So that's a big deal. And all the business, imp- I mean, there's a huge impact. Yeah. That. And for the kids that that's their only meal in the day, eating lunch at school. Now that's one of the big concerns is what do you do for these kids who that was, that was their source of food during the school years, that lunch at school. And now they don't have that either. And so providing for those kids and making sure that they're cared for, because sometimes the parents don't have the option to stay home with them. They got to find an alternative. Now I did see online a lot of parents who have high school kids offering their kids who babysit that during these three weeks they are available right. that if That's parents smart. are in need yeah. and again the kids get to make some money awesome but they also are available then to help those working parents who say you know, i got to be at work from eight to five can someone watch my kids during that time and so you know i've, I've been seeing some 
cool innovation there and some of the kids you know take advantage of that instead of a kid saying hey i'm out of school for three weeks they're saying how can i help and also be productive and do although something. i'm not sure it's a complete vacation right for so the kids. they may have to be they doing still some, do some school they're right. still figuring but if they're there but if they're there with you know a four-year-old right. or whatever yeah. because their daycare is closed they could probably do both i would assume now dewine did that's our governor here in ohio he did specify that this is not a mandate for religious gatherings Right, but, and I know that I think this is the case for all three of us. I think all three of our churches have said no in-person gatherings for that for for this period of right. time anyway. Yep. So we're gonna have an online service. Yep, uh, we are at too. least through at least through the time school's out. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's gonna be interesting, and I think that that's an area where our church leadership is taking precaution and trying to be prudent and ahead of the game. Where it's not a, we have a constitutional you know, right to meet, but it's maybe not the most wise thing to bring all those people together right now. Well, and you know, for a church, you you hate to think of it like this, but, um, I'm on the financial advisory team at the church. Now, a lot of people have went to online giving or regular monthly bank drafts, but there are uh, a large number of people that still put money in the offering box every week. And so impact. If the church is closed three, I know when, anytime we have bad weather, um, and, and lower attendance that week has an impact to giving. Yeah. Um, and if, if the, the people that attend the church are impacted economically, that could also Mm -hmm. be an impact. So hopefully our churches are prepared for something like this. And, and again, I'm, I'm, it's nothing I'm overly concerned about, but it, it is something that will be an impact. So I've heard that. People are panicking and buying up a bunch of toilet paper. <laughs> this is even true story all around the country, but I know this is the case in Finley, and I think that is crazy because unless this coronavirus scare makes you like crap your pants, that is it seems like overkill. You're not going to use any. See that as a symptom of yeah, the you're, coronavirus. You're not I don't know what's use happening. Any more toilet paper yeah. than you would on a normal day. Yep. So I think that's a little extreme. Josh, you have some friends or acquaintances. Yeah, so and- a neighbor of ours has a friend in Italy, mm-hmm. and she was sharing with us uh, a message they were sharing back and forth. But the the lady in Italy was kind of talking about how they've been in a quarantine for multiple weeks since the end of February, and how they still have the ability to go to the store and their store still has stuff in it. And she made the comment that we have toilet paper. I don't know what you guys are doing over there. They're in, <laughs> and actual, so they're quarantine. in actual quarantine. She lived in the Northern Italy. So uh, <laughs> my wife was just sharing with me that message she was showing me, but I just thought that was hilarious is yeah. kind of the question was, what is going on over there with you guys? Like what's this panic on toilet paper? Yeah. So you mentioned Italy and I think, you know, we see pictures and read stories about how bad things are and the fear that it's going to be that bad here. What what can they do, Josh? Can they still go to the grocery store and the pharmacy? Yeah. So the way the and I just read this message um, my wife passed on, but the way it, it was is they have the ability to go outside. They have the ability. They they take walks in the evening. They they go to the store when they need something. But it's just in a sense saying be smart about this. You know, if if there's a need, you go get the need and you come home. But don't interact and avoid a contact with people as much as possible. And so kind of that the kids are home from school. That's similar to what we are experiencing now with this closure. But the, in general, it's it's not like you're stuck in your house, windows closed, don't leave. It's more just, hey, all unnecessary stuff is eliminated. This is like an introvert's dream. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we should think about what a quarantine economy, economy will look like here in the States. Because in my, I mean, I'm not terribly old, but in my lifetime, this has never really been, uh, never been a case that we've had to deal with. So it's kind of unprecedented in the U.S. But I feel like with kids out of school and many people working from home, people are just going to act differently. They're going to spend their money differently. Those are definite realities that we're sure. going to see. I really think that this could see kind of a return uh, to more cooking at home versus mm. eating out because yeah. you're going to be afraid of of people running into people and big restaurants full of people and all that stuff. And I love cooking. So I think that's going to be pretty good. I think that's going to continue that. We'll and, be over uh, for dinner. Mm, it's good stuff. I'll make something good. I'll tell you what. Um, I think that this could mean more streaming movies on your TV instead of going to a movie theater. I think this is going to make people continue to increase their reliance on e-commerce and buying things online. So they're scared to go to the store. Whether they should or shouldn't be, they're going to be scared to do things 
Um, but some things are going to remain, you know. I think that you're still going to need to go to the store to get your toilet paper or whatever that might be. Milk, things that you really can't order online, you're still going to need to go to Kroger to get or whatever that mm-hmm. might be. So it's going to look a lot different. Um, the risk, I think, though, is that people won't take this seriously and that maybe after a week or so people are bored out of their minds and just decide to go do whatever they want anyway. Right. I don't. I, I mean, that how could, long can you put America yeah. on lockdown? Like we're the yeah. home land of the free and the home of the brave. Yeah. Right. I'm going to brave the coronavirus and be free to do what I want. Yeah, I've and, had the flu before. Yeah, I exactly. survived it, right? It can't yeah. be that bad. And that's part of the issue is there's high-risk groups of people and low-risk. And if you're thinking selfishly, you say, hey, even if I get this, the chances are small that it drastically impacts me. So what am I worried about? But the chance that you could pass that on and not realize it to somebody who could be drastically impacted. So it's that matter of you know the selfish, well... I shouldn't have to worry about this. Why is it affecting my life? To what could I do to help others from having this drastically impact them? And that's that's going to be the big issue is how long will people selflessly sacrifice kind of that freedoms they could have Correct. to help other yeah. people? I think that we really can't continue this discussion without mentioning oil. Oh, Oil is absolutely. a huge driver of the economy, right? So we saw over last weekend that Saudi Arabia announced that it would drastically increase oil production, which is the opposite of what you need to do when oil prices are down. That's not good. So that right. sent oil prices down further. So why'd they do it? Well, they did it in response. So Russia pretty much said, nah, OPEC, I don't want to cut production. As OPEC said, you should probably cut production because of this oil price slide we've been seeing. Well, the slide turned into a drop. And overnight, oil prices dropped 30%, which means every stock involving oil in any way shape or form was just crushed this week that's not good and we, you know we we are in finley ohio and marathon petroleum is across the street from our office mm-hmm. so we watched that stock go down for a lot of time and a lot of this is due to people anticipate oil demand being weak in this time of uncertainty and then the oil demand being weak causes prices to be weak and then creating more supply causes prices to be weak. It's kind of a self-perpetuating downward spiral of oil prices. So that's not good. And also, people watch high-yield treasury spreads as kind of a recession indicator. And a lot of the high-yield bond market is oil companies. And when their source of revenue, selling of oil and petroleum products, comes down, they become more risky on paper all of a sudden, so the sure. yield has to be higher to accom- to accom- or to accommodate investors for that, while treasury yields are stupid low. So that spread has gotten really, really, really wide, and that has really caused more people to be even more scared. So that caused, on Monday, the first of two circuit breakers that tripped in the first few minutes of trading um, in the stock market. So what is a circuit breaker? Well, you know, a circuit breaker is something that has been implemented into our trading system where if there is a sudden drop in the market, a quick sell-off, that this will pause trading for 15 minutes and it just allows everybody to take a breath. So, and again, when we talk about the automation, there's a lot of things that can trigger. And if you're not aware, you could have stuff trigger that you may have stopped because you, you did not want this because of a real quick downward move. And so 15 minutes, trading is paused. Um, and then once it restarts, that circuit breaker won't be triggered again and the next one has to be triggered. So 7% is the first one. Yep. So if you hit 7%, 15 minute pause, then it reopen the market. If it hits 7% again, it doesn't pause because that triggers already happened. The next one's 13% and then 20%. This happens throughout the day up until 325. Why they chose that, I don't know. Why it couldn't be 330, who knows? Um, probably because they were looking at 59 and a half and they'd like to confuse people. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> after that, then it won't pause for the rest of the day. Um, that 20%, I think, actually um, closed the market. Is that right? When it hits that? Yeah, I think 20% I think so. closes the market yep. for the day. Um, which is, so give investors a lot of time yep. to think about what's really yep. going and on. And this week, um, was the first time it triggered since 2008 and it happened twice. And so we had two different times that the just the 7% one was triggered. Um, yeah, so it's just the downside protection of, again, panic. Like the idea that there's compounding right. on maybe irrational or things that don't necessarily have any fundamentals behind it for the sell. Do you think it's possible that we could have so much panic in the market or so much selling that they actually close the markets for a cooling off period? Well, uh, there's a lot of discussion right now 
around shutting down the NYSE. Now, what that on paper sounds like is that stocks will not be able to be traded, right? You're not bringing together the buyers and sellers at an exchange. The reality is that the shutting down of these stock exchanges is likely a precaution for safety for the traders on the floor and that the or you know the stock market would revert to electronic trading only. Mm-hmm. So I do not feel like we are going to all of a sudden stock market's going to be you can't buy Close. and sell. Yeah, I don't think you're going to not be able to buy and sell stocks. I don't think that that is really a reality, but I think that we could see especially in New York where there's a lot of cases and it's a state of emergency or whatever that you could shut down the actual physical stock exchanges. You'll just go to online trading. So I guess we should talk about the economic impact and areas of the economy that stand to be most impacted and least impacted through this. I think that at a very high level, you know, I think that things that will drastically cut back on buying during these times of panic are going to get hurt the worst. So mm-hmm. that would be travel. We've seen that with airlines and hotels and most airline stocks are down 50% already. And and obviously oil stocks that drive Mm-hmm. Travel is hugely impacted and right. tied to the oil stocks, so that's crazy. Restaurants probably stand to have some risk. Cr- cruise ships, apparently. Cru- I hear cruise, cruise ships are not a good place to be, so probably hold off on booking that cruise, even though you could probably get a heck of a deal right now. Buy one week, get two free. That's right, I mean, in the quarantine. <laughs> if, you're, if you're willing to... So I wonder if you get the coronavirus and get healed... If you're immune, the that's second time. you're pretty much like so you can do whatever you want. Yeah, you, <laughs> you can go around the world for five dollars, um, but really anything discretionary is going to be impacted. But there are areas that that stand to be letter, lesser impacted or favorably impacted, and those would kind of be obviously businesses relating to medic or medical businesses, hospitals, doctors. Those are going to see a lot of action. Probably do okay. Pharmaceutical companies, either in the treatment and vaccine and drug development for this actual case or other cases probably going to do okay during this e-commerce companies people are going to be crazy about that telecommunication companies because people are going to be communicating from home for school for work for whatever that is those can all stand the game as well as consumer staples companies like groceries and discount stores discount discount stores those are probably going to do okay too because of the panic buying that's not necessarily due to fundamental changes that's due to people going crazy and those are places that could do okay. So, Adam, what is a bear market? So, yeah, a bear market is a drop of 20% or more from the most recent all-time high. So, you might hear the term correction. A correction is a 10% drop. So, we've had several corrections along the way. Um, bear markets. Now, we did have a drop in 2011 when Standard & Poor's downgraded the U.S. debt rating. Summer 2011. We dropped 19, but never 20% on a closing basis. Right. And then the fourth quarter of 2018, uh, that's when we dropped, um, we had a 19% decline. I think it was 19.8. So yeah. some have rounded it up to a 20%, yeah. but, um, and that bottomed on Christmas Eve, 2018, um, but never broke that 20% number on a closing basis until yesterday. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the magic number. And history says that the average bear market, some are worse than others. Of course, um, the average bear market does have about a 30% drop. Um, if you're rounding, we're getting there. We're getting real close (laughs) down 27%. So so what do you think about this one? Is this, I mean, have we seen it is like you said, the market this morning is looking up is, are we heading back up from here? Do we see the bottom? Oh, so you're going to ask me to speculate, make a <laughs> I prediction. Want you to, I want the exact number. That's yeah, right. go okay. All right. Well, we all want to know, don't we? We're all bottom fishing right now. That's right. You know, if you have some cash, you want to, you don't want to buy until you're at the bottom. Right. The exact bottom. Um, but reality is that no one can accurately forecast that consistently. Um, that being said, I know people love to hear opinions. And so I'll give you my opinion with all the disclaimers attached, to, of course, um, yeah, but you know, my crystal ball says, look, if you look at the momentum and the powerful move that we've seen down this week, it's been pretty violent selling. And, and last week, yeah, the last two and, weeks. Well, yeah, Woo! since since just in the past, oh, what, 17 days or so. Right. Um, I really think it's too early to call this a bottom. 
even though we're seeing a bounce today, you're going to see those throughout the bear market. You're, you know, 2008, 2009 saw a, a lot of big up and down days, just like you're seeing now. Um, but I think what the market really wants here is they want to see an economic stimulus package from the government. Um, and until we know what that looks like, we just have too much economic uncertainty. We also don't know, um, you know, what the spread of the virus is going to look like, you know, looking at the initial growth rate in China and the, the brisk spread that we saw in less than three weeks in Italy, we've seen just a glimpse of what other countries face if they cannot slow that contagion. So I, I do think we are taking the right steps by canceling everything. Do I like it? No, I don't like it at all. Um, will it hurt us economically? Yes, it absolutely will. Um, but the problem here that we have is we just don't know how long it's going to take to ensure that this is under control. So I think the key right now when, you know, as an investor and trying to determine the extent of this bear market, um, really is, is there's just too many unknowns right now. So for that reason, I do expect to see at least another 10%, maybe 20% down from current levels. Um, the market hates uncertainty and we have a lot of it right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, until we get some good news and we will get good news. Okay. Sure. Yeah. It's a matter of you when, have, not yeah, if. it's a matter of when, um, history tells us that we will prevail. And, but until then we have to brace ourselves as an investor, prepare yourself for more downside plan ahead. How are you going to react to that? So, you know, to talk numbers. Okay. I think a good test for the market will be that December 2018 low. We talked about that. that Christmas uh, Eve. Yep. Christmas Eve 2018. Exactly. Um, so the S&P level was right around 2350 at that point. Um, if we can stay above that level, it will act as support. And if we start getting better news off of that level, I think you could look at that as a buying opportunity. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, this would be a total drawdown of about 31% from all time highs that we uh, saw just a few weeks ago, um, but only 4% down from yesterday's close. So we're not that far away from that number. Another unhappy day like yesterday or whatever. And could be there. Take it, take it right down. Yeah. Yep. Um, so speaking of that, though, you we got some questions in sure. um, from users. And one of them was, what are some dumb moves in this market? <laughs> some dumb moves. Well, I think the one that came to mind when I, when I first heard that question was, so you know, everybody working from home, many of them are using Zoom to, you know, run their virtual meetings. So Zoom is software that allows you to, um, you know, basically video conference and share your screen with, with each other. And there's a, there's another stock by the same name and people are buying that stock oh. instead of the actual Zoom stock. That, that is a dumb name yeah. or a dumb, dumb, that is dumb a dumb move. move. That's dumb move. Dumb yes. Yes. <laughs> so if you're going to speculate, know what you're speculating in. Do your homework. Do your homework. You know how many times I've seen people make the mistake of buying something without doing their homework. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned Twitter. I really do um, like Twitter a lot. And uh, I'm getting a lot of information from Twitter before I get it from anywhere else. But there's also, you have to look out, there's a certain sector on Twitter, if, if you follow stocks on Twitter that are pumping stocks, and they're promoting stocks because they own them. And, you know, if you just take random tips off Twitter without doing your own homework, it's like, yeah. you know, you know, taking your investing tips from the cocktail hour at the, the after hours receptions. I think, yeah, taking buys and sells of the market or specific companies from social media is very dangerous in this environment. So it's best to kind of keep keep your hat on where you're where you're keeping an eye on things and doing your due diligence on all of your all of your moves that you're making. So Adam, as investors, what technical factors are kind of going to indicate that we're headed back into a bull market or that things have bottomed there are kind of turning around? Yeah. So, well, you know, I think fundamentals are one thing. We know the fundamentals were strong before we, we had this bear market. So economic fundamentals that is. And so I think the market has legs to stand on economically. We weren't you know, some people say, well, the market was uh, due for a correction or it, I mean, correction, maybe, but, but, you know, a lot of people say, well, I saw this coming because of last year's gains. Well, I think that those gains were justified with the corporate earnings growth the way it was. But I think so now 
we have the fundamentals. Um, we certainly need to see companies, you know, rebound from this, but the market looks ahead. You know, we haven't even hit a recession yet and the market's telling us we're going to have one. And so the market is, the market is forward looking. And so as far as, you know, looking for the end of the bear market, there's a couple things you can look at. So I think the simplest, I'll give you just a couple simple things to look at. And those are moving averages. So a moving average is just an average of the last days of price. So for Mm -hmm. instance, the long-term trend can be designated by the 200 day moving average. The 200 day moving average is the average price the market has traded at the last 200 days. And that is often seen as the long-term trend. If that average is sloping up and if the current price is above that line, that's a positive indicator. Well, right now we're below the 200 day moving average and the 200 day moving average is falling. If you see that turn around, that's a good signal that the long-term trend has changed. But if you're just waiting on that, it could be too long, too late. It's a, it's a slower indicator. So you can look at things like the 50 day or the 20 day moving average and the same concept applies. Um, yeah, I think that, and I think it's probably also to to understand that at least my opinion is that this, the, the economic impact of what we're seeing right now is probably going to be shorter than we saw in the last big a, yeah, a bear market 2009. and B recession. Yeah. Uh, it was. This is something that after a quarter, a couple quarters, you know, three quarters at the most, who knows? It's going to be a lot shorter than the last recession we yeah. saw. Things will pick up because the underlying fundamentals are way stronger than they were back then. Yeah, yeah that was way. another question we got. I think people, there. This is too reminiscent of 2008, and and people want to know how does this compare to 08? And so, you know. What do you see, Austin, um, you know, watching this every day? Um, how, how do you think we compare economically to 08? Yeah, I mean, we don't have the structural issues as an economy with the banks getting crazy out of leverage and stuff like that than we did in 08. So I think that we have a lot of tests in place that should prevent sort of a financial crisis from occurring, which is really, really good. I also feel like with unemployment, at really, really, really low levels that once people can kind of get back to work and through all of this, they're going to have a lot of money to spend and things are going to be going pretty well. So should be a little bit shorter, but we've got to get through the uncertainty before it's going to make any difference at all. So I think once we get through that, I think I, I think that by you'll start seeing things improve in the third quarter this year. Um, I think after the second quarter is going to be the roughest for sure from the big big impact here yeah and i think you know talking between the recession and the bear market we're going through you know the big question is like what does this mean for the average investor like what what changes what what should be happening and you know when we talk to young investors like this is an opportunity if you are adding to your retirement accounts if you have every paycheck money going in your your dollar cost averaging through this and um, that's the best thing you can do in this downturn is you're buying things at a lower price or in a sense, you're buying more shares every time because they're cheaper. Um, so dollar cost averaging is a great thing to do, especially when you're a young investor. It gives you a lot of time uh, for this to grow through. Tax loss harvesting, things are down. If you need to offset some gains, you could sell some stuff with not the idea that you're selling because you're panicked, but you're selling to take advantage of some tax situations. Um, Roth conversions, uh, moving money into a Roth IRA, again, at a lower value um, is a nice tax advantage. Again, we're just talking tax impacts here um, because, again, you're moving money that's invested in an IRA into a Roth IRA. So you're still going to be invested. You're just doing it at a lower tax cost than you would have a couple months ago. Um, You know, there's a lot of things out there that are now an opportunity that weren't worth two months ago. True. Right. And then for the someone looking to buy a house with the Great rate cuts, opportunity. Yeah, yeah, refinancing or getting a new mortgage. There's, I mean, it's cheap. If you're locking in this rate for 30, 15, 30 years, man, you're going to be happy you're paying this right. fixed rate instead of waiting. Never uh, for a better to time up. to buy a house than now. Right. Um, and again, now you know it's not the best time, but now is a time to look at your risk tolerance. Now, we don't suggest you make any changes, especially if you're reducing your risk. And now is not the time to do that because things are down. Um, so if you're reducing your risk, that means you're selling your What do you recommend, equities. Josh? You know, so, say somebody is experiencing a little bit of pain right now and saying, I wish I was lighter on my stock allocation and I'm worried things are going to get worse. Do you recommend that they make an adjustment now or what would you tell them to do? You know, if you've stomached through this 25% drop, you know, the 
the that's a big drop already. You know, if you could sit through for the rest of it and let it recover, that's the best time to make an asset allocation adjustment. And it might be counterintuitive, but if you've got more of a balanced asset allocation, your stock portion, your equity portion is, is way down. So this is actually probably a better time to do to pull some out of your fixed income and into equities because they're down so much, yeah. which does not it's not what your stomach wants to do. Yeah. Especially with rates where they are, we, we you know, if, if you're a long term investor, right, and you know, this is money you're investing for the long term, and you've had some money in bonds, now could be a great time to redeploy that capital yeah. into the stock market. Yeah. But if you are really concerned about it, we talk about dollar cost averaging it, just readjust where that money is going, right? Build your fixed income side or your preservation side up by new money. Don't change the stocks out. But if you really are panicked about it, just readjust where you're putting new money in. So I think you know we, we a lot of the advice we give surround is, is is for people who are accumulating assets or still working. Um, but what about those, Josh? I know you meet with a lot of people. One of the things we do a lot of here is help people transition into retirement and then build a stream of income that will last a lifetime. Josh, what would you say to the person who was planning to retire this summer? Yeah. So if you're planning to write, retire this summer, uh, hopefully you've been talking with a financial advisor and working through a plan. And hopefully they've tested that plan against different situations, including what if the market drops heading into your retirement? Because that's what we consider a bad timing situation is your accounts are down in value. You're no longer adding new money to it and your income goes away. So now I'm drawing money out of the portfolio. Right. Testing against those situations hopefully will give you the peace of mind that worst case scenario, I've already looked at that simulation and it's still okay. But if you have the flexibility and you can work a little longer and let these markets recover, that's the best choice if you have yeah. that option. Like if you're able to say, you know what, I'm going to postpone the retirement for a couple months, six months, see where the market's at, see if I can get a bounce back in some of my assets. But the other thing is heading into retirement, having a cash piece where my immediate income needs are covered in something that's not exposed to this volatility. And for a lot of our clients, the talk is about having this cash reserve where if the markets are down, I stop pulling money out of the market and I start living off of a conservative or a cash piece where I don't care what the market's doing because I'm not touching that money for a set time period. So Adam, kind of wrap it up here for listeners and let's, let's reassure people and leave them on a positive note with with where we feel about how things are going to get better in the future and uh, kind of talk about some of the very, very practical behavioral things that, that you can do at this point in, in what we're seeing in the markets right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we certainly want to remind people that this is the time to be optimistic. This is not the time to allow fear to dominate your investment decisions. Um you know, Morgan Housel yesterday uh, published a post, um, and we can link to it in the show notes. But I want to quote one portion of that post that I think is very critical for any investor to keep in mind during these times. And that is, uncertainty shrinks your field of vision at the worst time. When the world changes in a 24-hour period, it becomes hard to think more than 24 hours ahead. The year ahead is impossible to envision when assumptions you had at breakfast time were destroyed by dinner time. The irony is that long-term thinking is most powerful when everything is falling apart. The majority of long-term results are determined by decisions that you make during a minority of times. And right now is one of those times. It's a tragic moment to become short-sighted. So what I would say is get the long-term charts out. Remind yourself that we've been here before. Um you know, and, and, and it's always hard to know how you're going to respond to risk until you actually have to respond to risk. And I think there's just so much happening right now that you just simply can't control. You know, there's no use worrying about those things. The list is way too long and, and you, you'll, you'll end up with analysis paralysis or you'll make some very bad moves. Um, you know, I think now is a time of opportunity. Um, you know, a lesson I learned years ago is to focus on the inputs and your response to certain events. So something I learned from Ohio State football coach, um, Urban Meyer, he, he hired a guy named Tim Kite um, during their championship season. And they operated by the following formula that year. E plus R equals O. And that is event plus response equals the outcome. So we can't choose the events that happen to us, but we can choose how we will respond 
And the way we respond to those events will ultimately determine the outcome. So using history as our guide, a response to a bear market should be to stay calm, stay focused on your long-term goals and look for opportunities. I wanted to take a moment and share a story about a bear market that I turned into an opportunity. So, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, starting my career in August, 2002. So we were actually in a bear market at the time. So the S and P 500 had reached an all time high. Oh, I think it was around March 24th of 2000. And so we were more than two years into a stock market decline. So it was long and painful. But if you look at the price from March of 2000 to August of 2002, we were down about 40%, 39%. And we started a business in a bear market. And I think just imagine with all that's going on, look at the possibilities for innovation. Um, think about you know the greatest breakthroughs of our history have come from times like this. Yeah, They've come from challenges that seemed insurmountable. I mean, look at the news this morning. We got news that Roche um, came up with a coronavirus uh, test uh, that will allow them to get results 10 times faster than any test before. That's awesome. And I'm waiting for someone to come up with treatments or vaccines for the coronavirus. But, you know, there's just so much that we can innovate how can our healthcare system improve as a result of this? We're going to yeah. learn from this. Oh, I think so. I think um, we already have. <laughs> so it's a time to, to, to make it, turn it into an opportunity. Um, but also a time now's the time to take advantage of depressed prices in the stock market. Oh yeah. If you have, if you have dry powder or cash, Absolutely. this is, this is the time to be very aggressive with your buying. So, you know, um, if we, if we just look at history, as our guide, um, our response to be to to a bear market should be just to stay calm. Uh, history does tell us that if you would sell at these levels, you'll look back in ten or twenty years and regret it. Yeah. So I wrote a blog post about ten days ago called "The Coronavirus: What Should Investors Do Next?" and we'll link to it in the show notes because I think everything still applies, even yeah. though we're lower in price mm -hmm. than we were then. Uh, my conclusion still stands: you wouldn't be human if you didn't fear loss. Mm -hmm. And smart investing can overcome the power of fear by focusing on relevant research, solid data, and things you can control. Investors who have the ability to tune out the news, focus on their long-term goals, and turn declines into opportunities are better positioned to succeed with their investment strategy. Stay calm, focus on those things you can control, and that's how you're going to achieve your goals. The odds are pretty high that in 2030, we can sit here and have a reunion show and look back on on this moment today and be thankful that we resisted the urge to make an emotional decision in times of turmoil. And lastly, I want to leave you with this. I do think that most people need the help of a financial advisor who's been trained for times like this, who who's going through the, the process of being certified as a financial planner, who has some sort of credential and, and has experience. Um, so if you don't have an advisor, hit us up. We're happy to talk to you. Um, and if you do, that's great. Um, call your advisor if you have questions. Yeah. And you know, that's key is if you're worried about doing this yourself, there are people out there that love doing this and love helping people. You, you're not in this alone. And if you are struggling, reach out to somebody that is in this industry that is a professional and is able to help you. Um, that's, a, that's what we love doing. That's what we're here for. And this is the time in a market where financial advisors really are in their keep. Absolutely. Because what their goal is in this time, it's it's easier to take a more passive approach in a very, very strong bull market. But in times like this, when things are down, this is where an advisor is going to talk you out of making a bad decision that is going to impact your financial future and your plan for the rest of your life, potentially. If, if you do something really, really stupid. Absolutely. And, you know, Josh wouldn't, wouldn't share this, but I'll share it for him. I watched him yesterday get on the phone all day long, call after call, reaching out to clients, asking them, how are you feeling? What are your concerns? And those conversations are very important during times like this. Um, Clients want to know that that we are watching things and that we're here to help. And so yesterday morning when we had our team meeting, I saw I saw our advisor team say, now's our time to shine. 
we're going to get out there and we're going to talk to people. And Josh, what are some things you heard from people yesterday? Yeah, you know, talking? the nice thing is pretty much everybody I talked to, I can't think of an exception to this yesterday, is they they were thankful for the call um, just as reassurance. They, they wanted to make sure I'm not missing anything, right? I'm doing the things we w- have been talking about. And it was that reassurance of our long-term plan still in place. Your long-term goals are still achievable if we stick to the plan. And that was the reassurance that they needed. It wasn't, here's anything crazy we're doing, anything special. It's just, let's let's go back and again and say, okay, where are we at? Where are we going? And are we still on the right path to get there? Adam, I know this has been a heavy topic. Yes. But because it's Friday, I think we should have a dad joke of the week. The second dad joke of the oh, week. Yeah. Special even, dad joke. A dad joke. Even on a s- coronavirus episode. Okay. Well, I do love telling dad jokes. Sometimes he even laughs. <laughs> uh, so why is it so hard to tell a joke to retired people? Why is that? Hmm. Because none of them work. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That Josh is going to write that I one like down. I'm going to keep that one. That's <laughs> that a good one, one. You could use. Well, Adam, we are so thankful that you were able to take some time because it is an all hands on deck. No, 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 no. I am thankful for you guys. And so before we go, I, I brought a gift for you guys. Uh oh. Ready for this? I didn't know it was a gift day. Oh, man. And I didn't bring anything for you. Yep. <laughs> I buy gifts in bear markets. So here you go, guys. Oh, boy. Whoa. So for, for all the audience that can't see, which would be everybody, uh, we, <laughs> Austin and I are getting Dow 30,000 shirts from Adam. And so we're in anticipation for the bounce back. The so bounce Dow 30,000. Okay. So the shirt, what color is the shirt? Green. It's green. Green. Aren't you tired of seeing red? I yes. know. Let's be bullish. We're going to get some green around the office That's today. Right. So Dow 30,000. I mean, that was reachable just we were close two months ago. Yeah. And uh, you know what? It's a reminder that... Dow 30,000 is still a number we will hit one yeah. day. Yep. There's no such thing as an unrealistic goal, just an unrealistic deadline. It's, so it's right. a reminder that the best is yet ahead. Yep. Absolutely. We're going we're going to come through this the as best a country. Is always ahead. As an economy, it's going to be better. So let's do it. We we'll appreciate proudly. it. I will. That's awesome. awesome. Well, as always, especially in times like this, don't hesitate to check out our website because we've got a brief list of eight timeless principles of investing that are really going to try and keep you on track in times like this where things are uncertain, moving every day, huge swings. Check it out. It's free on our website. And make sure you share this podcast, especially if you know anybody that's been asking about this bear market recession or anything going on. Share this with your friends and family. Send us any questions or ideas you have at hello at theinvesteddads.com and make sure you like and review us on Apple Podcasts. And in case you missed it, check out our recent episode where we discussed streaming services. I will thank you, Adam, for joining us and we wish everybody a good and safe weekend. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Invested Dads podcast. This episode has ended, but your journey towards a better financial future doesn't have to. Head over to theinvesteddads.com to access all the links and resources mentioned in today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and we had a positive impact on your life, leave us a review. Click subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Josh Robb and Austin Wilson work for Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Josh, Austin, or any podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Hicks and Zerker Capital Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. There is no guarantee that the statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses, which would reduce returns. Securities investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There is no assurance that any investment plan or strategy will be successful.